Hello, and welcome back to the channel. This is John. For today's topic, we're going to be taking a look at people who are in places that shouldn't exist. Please be sure to like and subscribe. I was about 9 or 10 when this happened. At the time we were looking for houses and my father was interested in owning a farmstead, and in Illinois there's quite the amount of farms. We were trying to find this one acreage that was out in the middle of nowhere Illinois and we got lost since there was no connection anywhere so we just started wandering until we found this cute little town. The town looked and felt like one of those touristy places that's kinda western themed and with this nice little dinosaur pizzeria, feels kinda like wall drug in SD. Everything was alright as far as I remember, all I cared about was the dinosaur TBH, and we got directions or something and stumbled upon this nice, and rather large, estate that seemed abandoned because all the buildings were kinda falling apart. It was a cool place I'll admit there were several barns, a nice house, horse stables, a little windmill, a silo, all the things you'd imagine to be on a typical farm. Although it was really run down and everything, we still decided to explore. It was cool and all but there were dead cats everywhere. I went through the stables and there were cat skeletons littered around and with some still rotting away. It was pretty disturbing to say the least, but there were still a bunch of live cats roaming around in the barns and other places, just seems they go to die in the stables. We kept on exploring, pretty desensitized family, so it didn't bother us too much. Although, there is one thing that bothered the most, the barn. There were three barns. One was totally collapsed, one the cat seemed to have lived in, and the other was totally empty. The first two were okay in my book, but the empty one just had me. At the time I was trying to get over these god-awful nightmares I'd have and I had one that was just kinda a still image of some dark, old, wooden room and at the end of it was this X. It sounds plain when I describe it but that room would always be there at the end of every horrific nightmare I'd get, and would you know it, that's what the last barn was. I freaked the fuck out, I frantically tried to tell my mother not to go in but she'd just smile and tried to get me to come in and that it was okay. I don't remember too much of what happened after but whenever I try to ask about the farmstead, they would either say I don't know or they'd completely ignore it. My parents owned some land in very rural Colorado and I would use it to camp on sometimes because it's free camping so why not. Occasionally I would invite friends to come with me and nothing strange had happened before this incident. Due to circumstances my friend and I had to drive separately and I got there before her, set up camp, and waited. And waited. I kept waiting and my friend never showed up. I was obviously concerned but wanted to stick around in case she did show up. I waited until morning and then finally packed up camp and got back into service range to find out what the fuck had happened. Now, this part of the story I wasn't there for since I was already on the land, but apparently my friend was driving around looking for the plot and she just could not find it no matter what. She definitely got there after me but said she didn't see my car anywhere or any signs that someone was on the land. I parked in a spot where no one would be able to miss me specifically so that she could find it easily. So she kept driving around and started coming across all these ultra-religious creepy ass billboards that were warning about hell and damnation and all that fun stuff, which creeped her enough out that she turned around and just drove back home. Most people would think that she just went down the wrong road and that is what I thought too until we reconnected later and went over the map and she described the area. There was no way she wasn't in the right spot. The area she described perfectly matched where I was and she went down all the right roads but somehow got teleported into a creepy religious nightmare. I've been in the area a lot and I've never seen anything like she was talking about with those billboards. I'm not sure which alternate reality she drove into but I'm glad she made the decision to just drive home. My friends and I were going camping in the Ocala National Forest in Florida. It's miles upon miles of just woods out there, a few places here and there where people live but mostly just forest. We enter into the National Forest area on a long road. The first thing I notice is a broken up wooden sign that says hell. We go on a bit further. Our GPS is taking us down a road that it says will let out into another road and take us to the campsite. We go down the road and see some houses that have long driveways that appear to be built with the intention of being obscured from view. There's a few strange sculptures that look like large totems or something, their appearance made me a bit uneasy. We get to the end of the road and it doesn't let out. I see from what little of the houses are visible that there's people peeking out the windows at us, so we leave that place immediately and take a longer route to the campsite, a free primitive campground. Upon arrival there we see people who looked like they lived there, one guy was using what appeared to be a crack pipe and across from their sitting spot was a black hippie van style van with a bumper sticker that said I masturbate. We decide that we would take a spot far from them and try our luck, we did bring a gun in case of emergency and we reason that maybe if we stay to ourselves they will too. So we find our spot and notice a wooden cross in the ground. 
Not far from that we find a destroyed tent with clothes and food strewn about and what appears to be a trail where something was dragged off into the woods. We find another cross thrown on the ground a bit away, and as we poke around a bit more we see one of those totems built behind where those people were sitting. We decide to leave and go to a campground we have to pay for. Two of our friends left to buy firewood and they said they found a sign that said free firewood and followed it. They said they wound up in a shanty area with seemingly abandoned trailers and found nobody around. So they decided to sit for a moment and see if they saw anyone. They said that someone looked out a window and just stared at them and they got scared and left. In the Ocala National Forest area there are a lot of places that give you an I shouldn't be here feeling. I have a few other stories from the area, this was just a brief version of our first excursion out there. Was on a road trip a few years back from QLD through to Broken Hill. We were trying to get to Burke by nightfall after being warned about ruse on the road at dusk, and we were in a fairly small car with no bull bar so being hit by a roux was a real concern. By this point it's about 4.30 and we've been driving through the middle of nowhere for maybe an hour, with huge red anthills on either side of the road. It's getting dark and we want to speed up a bit and get to Burke because by this point we're all busting for the bathroom. Anyway, we speed up a bit, and that's where things get weird. We start losing kilometers on the dashboard, with the numbers heading downward, and gaining a tank of petrol. We pass these same anthills again, next to the same clump of trees. My dad suggested we took a turn at some point and looped back, so we dismissed it and kept going towards Burke Strait. We get further than we did before, and end up in this strange little town. It's quarter past five on a Friday and everything is completely shut. It's definitely dusk by now, but there are no lights on anywhere. We stop at the pub to use the toilets, but upon entry the pub is completely empty, although the television is on, just making a buzzing sound and displaying static. We're a bit freaked out so we leave the pub, which had opened doors but nobody inside, and head for the public toilets in the park. We go in and there's no lights inside, so we use the torch lights of our phone and find that all three cubicles are locked, though as far as we can tell, nobody is inside. We go back to the car and drive around looking for bathrooms, though we can't find any others, and so we agree that we just really need to keep driving for we've booked a hotel already in Burke. We drive on the one road out of the town and just before we come to the sign saying you are leaving underscore, we see a sheep on the road. It's pretty large and just stares at the car, and even after sitting there for a few minutes and honking it won't move. Eventually we just drive around it and go on our way. After that the trip was pretty normal, but on the way back we made sure to go a different route. That town was just too creepy. I was driving back to San Francisco from Disneyland in the middle of the night with two friends. They were asleep, and I was doing my best to get us home. What should have been a 7-hour drive came out to a 10-hour drive due to construction, accidents, etc. It was around 1 in the morning, and we needed gas. This was in the middle of nowhere in I-5 about 45 minutes north of Grapevine. I pulled off the highway and into a brightly lit gas station. As I parked the car at the pump, I noticed that the ground appeared to be moving. I thought it was an illusion because it was late and I was very tired, so I woke my friends up. Um, is the ground moving? I asked. It sure the fuck is. They both said at the same time. After a minute or two of our eyes adjusting to the brightly lit gas station, it became clear that the ground was completely covered in what I can only assume were locusts. What I had assumed was asphalt at first turned out to be insects. Millions of insects covering the ground as far as I could see. We turned the car back on and got the hell out of there as fast as we could, and found another gas station about 10 miles further up the road. To this day, we still aren't sure it wasn't a shared hallucination. I've done minimal research on it and haven't found anything that would suggest this is a regular occurrence in California. I was in southern Alberta about 10 years ago and we went out to look at my grandma's school, now abandoned, from when she was a kid. It was in a field in the middle of nowhere but it was big enough to have a gymnasium and looked to be about 8 to 10 classrooms, from back in the day when multiple grades would be in the same class I believe. The door was boarded up but it had been broken down. Inside the door was stairs going up to a long hallway of doors for classrooms and down going to the gymnasium, Gym was at ground level and the classrooms were above it. The classrooms were pretty freaky on their own since all the windows were boarded up too. We had a flashlight and looked around the hole upstairs. When we went back downstairs the gym floor was all warped and cracked from water damage, it was like walking on rapids from a river with how warped the water damage made it. Off to the side of the gym was what looked like a cafeteria and a kitchen, it still had all the old cooking appliances inside. And a coffin. There was this big ass coffin on the floor in the middle of the kitchen. Looked like the kind you would see at any funeral home, probably made of rich mahogany or some shit. Maybe my young mind was playing tricks on me but it looked like it was full of and surrounded by dry blood and we noticed that the kitchen area looked recently used. 
It was at that point that my cousin got a bad feeling and basically pulled us out of this old building and we took off in his car. Pretty scary now that I think about it. Once when the first band I played in were on our first tour, we did a West Coast tour from our hometown of Oakland, CA to Seattle. We were on our way to Salem, Oregon, and we stopped at a gas station in a small town by Mount Shasta after playing Chico. A young man, late teens slash early 20s, walked up to me and asked me are you here for the gathering? I responded um, no. What gathering? I then noticed, that his eyes were completely black. I don't know if he was wearing contacts, or if he was a Beck, but in hindsight he acted like the latter because he had a blank look on his face and a deadpan emotionless tone in his voice. Plus the way he blankly stared at me creeped me the F out. He didn't tell me any more about this gathering after my response to him, and my bandmates called for me to get back in the van to go. As I walked back to the van, the young man was following me about 5 feet behind me. I hastened my pace and hopped into the passenger seat, and he was standing right outside my door looking at me through the window. As we drove off he reached out and touched the van, eerily similar to when the crazy guy marked the van with a bloody handprint in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I don't know if he was an actual Beck, or just a crazy guy on drugs with black contacts, but that creeped me out for quite a while afterwards, to the point I would send my bandmates into the gas station to pick up whatever snacks slash smokes I wanted and would stay in the van and not leave it. Let's get started, I've been an urban exploration enthusiast for about 10 years now. I've been in some remote places, I have literally hundreds of pictures from the gutted innards of the overgrown but indestructible Buckner building in Whittier, Alaska, and inside the subterranean viscera of others, the tunnel systems beneath Sioux in Utah, underfoot thousands of people there for the annual Shakespeare Festival. But creepy? Scary? I'm not sure which would take the cake. I've spent quite a bit of time in Twin Arrows and Two Guns. Now, Twin Arrows is just an abandoned trading outpost, but Two Guns, now within the borders of Winslow, but still ostensibly haunted, probably takes the cake. It is, or was, as I'm not sure of its present state, known primarily as a ghost town, replete with abandoned swimming pools, derelict outposts and water towers, and occasionally a half-deconstructed tower or two. But what disturbed me about Two Guns wasn't the more recent buildings that lay in partial ruin it was the crevasses that, often without warning, seemed to open up beneath your feet with yawning, hungry mouths. Like sideways tunnels, they twisted and turned with jagged teeth and if you shined a flashlight down them just right, you could almost see twinkling near the bottom. At first, I assumed they were abandoned mining projects, but if that were the case, why would they be so unmanicured? These were definitely natural formations but more importantly, they were new. Yelling down into them was an act of strangeness. The echoes that came back up were distorted, flattened, hollow. My exploration partner, now deceased, unfortunately, not by natural causes per se but certainly not supernatural either, this isn't a creepypasta folks, and I decided to move along. Later down the road there was a wider canyon, this one with wood planks spanning it. We thought better than to attempt a crossing, but did climb a tower that allowed us a better view of the area. It was surreal. The brittle bones of several establishments built in various time periods were visible from this height from the newer construction of water towers to the historic brick and adobe shells of the settlement before that. We left after perhaps six hours. I will never forget that trip. As I mentioned before, my exploration partner died seven years ago, otherwise I'd have him chime in on this post. I do have pictures, if there's enough demand though. I went to college along the central coast of California, in San Luis Obispo to be exact. My friends and I heard that there was an abandoned, haunted asylum and we wanted to check it out. We researched it and apparently the accurate history of the building was an orphanage, not an asylum. If you just Google San Luis Obispo Asylum a bunch of stuff will come up, so, us being college students, we wanted to go ahead and explore it, check it out, see just how haunted the place was. One of our friends had the brilliant idea to go at night, add the to spooky feel. We got there, started exploring a bit. It was definitely creepy, definitely abandoned, and probably haunted. However, the unexplained story started about 20 minutes after we got there to explore. We were all walking around the perimeter of the building, looking for cool rooms to go into and rummage around in, pitch black, only using our phone flashlights as our sources of light, when we started hearing something pelting the walls near us. Originally we thought one of our friends had strayed from the group and was trying to fuck with our heads, but all four of us were accounted for, looking at each other in confusion. We all shushed each other and told each other to listen to see what the fuck that noise was, and at this point the fun, adolescent adrenaline of being young and exploring scary places was completely being overtaken by the holy shit we're definitely about to die to ghosts or crazy people adrenaline. As we listened, one of my friends suddenly shouted in pain with a big ol' ouch. What the fuck? And when we asked what happened, 
He said he just got hit by a fucking rock. So that noise we were hearing was rocks being thrown at us in odd intervals from some unknown source. We waited for the next rock to be thrown, and as we caught a glimpse of the rock flying, we all aimed our flashlights at the location of where the rock came from, and there was nothing fucking there. We were expecting to see an angry hobo, or some other college kids trying to mess with us. But instead, we saw jack shit. Absolutely nothing. As soon as we realized rocks were just flying at us with no one visible where the rocks were originally being thrown from, I must say that is the fastest I have ever seen a group of college kids run. We ran for our lives, and never looked back. We're all graduated now and doing well, but in the following years after that incident while we were still attending university, whenever the freshman asked about the abandoned asylum, it's a pretty well-known rumor on the college campus that it's a haunted asylum, we would warn them that it's not worth it to go there, it's just an empty building, kind of just trying to convince these kids to not risk anything by going and checking it out like we did. Maybe during the day it wouldn't be so bad? But definitely don't go there at night. I never went back to that godforsaken building, not even in the daytime. I call this my ghost house. We lived in rural trail, Oregon for 20 plus years. To visit family up north we always drove the Tiller Trail Highway which brought us out on I-5 at Canyonville. It's a beautiful drive and we've taken it dozens of times. One of the first times we drove from trail to Canyonville I saw a flash of a white house on the left side of the road. It was old and the yard and trees were overgrown but could have been inhabited at that point. It was on a bit of land next to the, the highway. From the brief glimpse I got I saw that it was set into some really thick, tall Douglas fir trees and I remember thinking that house would not get a lot of sunlight in winter. On the way back that same trip I looked for that house and could not see it. Pretty much forgot about it till a few months later and specifically looked for it again and still couldn't find it. After that it got to be a hide and go seek thing since sometimes I'd see a flash of it and sometimes not. The family thought I was nuts. Finally started diligently paying attention and spotted it and figured it out. Only the dark of winter when the leaves were gone from the trees and a certain time of day when the sun cut through those dense fir trees, the house was briefly visible. During the spring and summer when everything was leafed out it disappeared again behind the green. And it was only visible if you were heading towards Canyonville, not the other direction, and only at a certain time of day in winter. But truly, I kind of wish it was a time-shifting ghost house. Think of the stories. This is my mom's story. This was about 1996 to 1997 in California on a highway, either 5 or 101, on a long desolate stretch, which makes my mom believe it was 5. We were coming from Southern California and going back home to Northern California. My sister was 2 or 3 and I was 3 or 4, and we were asleep in the backseat. My mom says that she was on the road with a few cars. Off in the distance and in the sky, there was a shiny object hovering. She figured it was tethered somehow. As she was getting closer, more and more cars were getting off at exits. She could see that it was silver and round and it didn't seem to be tethered but still figured had it must be. More and more cars got off until it was just her and another car, and she was close enough at this point, she could see underneath it, to see that one, the object was not tethered to the ground in any way, it was hovering too, it was completely silent 3, it was a silver, metal aircraft 4, there was an airplane stuck to the bottom of it. This was after about a half an hour of driving towards it. She was terrified to stop and document it or study it more. She wanted to film it, she had the camcorder, but was too afraid to pull off to the side of the road and be left behind by the other car. My mom rarely talks about this. She is not a conspiracy theorist, doesn't believe in alien contact, the paranormal, or anything like that. My grandfather, who we had visited on that trip, was an army colonel, and my mom didn't even want to bring it up to him because she thought he'd think she was insane. No explanation. There used to be a cowboy apparel store near the expressway by me. It was there for as long as I could remember but I never saw any cars parked outside it or anything like that. Being that cowboy apparel isn't exactly popular where I live, I wasn't surprised that nobody ever visited there. I decided to go inside one day out of curiosity and it was nothing special. It was just like a clothing store except more cowboy hats and less shorts. While I was in there, which was only for a couple minutes to look around, I didn't see any workers or employees which was nice since I didn't want anyone asking about my leather boot preferences. I left the store and never went back. A year or so later, I found out it burned down. I drove past the area where it was and sure enough, there was the charred carcass of a once standing cowboy apparel store. Well, I told some friends and family about it and they said they had never heard of or seen this place. I told them it was the one right by the expressway and they said they had never seen it. They told me that area of land had always been empty. I asked some other people and co-workers and they all said the same thing. I started getting a bit sketched out so I googled it and couldn't find a single thing about it burning down. 
Hell, I couldn't even find any evidence of the place existing in the first place. I drove back with a friend of mine and it looked like nothing was there in the first place. It was like a building was never erected there at all let alone one that caught fire. It was just green grass like everywhere else surrounding the area. I know it had to have existed since I walked around inside of it but nobody but me seems to even realize it was there at all. So not creepy or anything but just over a year ago me and my girlfriend were on holiday in Tenerife. As the hotel's night entertainment was shocking we went out most nights, British bars small pubs slash bars and the like. One particular night we walked in a different direction to the usual, and as we rounded a corner we heard some kind of house music blaring from a bar above us. We decided to go up the stairs to it and see what it was like. The place was decorated extremely nightclub-esque with LEDs and strobes on every solid surface you could see, not our usual place to be as we don't really like busy places but this place was dead, strange considering it was a 5 minutes walk from the main strip. Including us and the girl on the bar there were 5 people in the entire place. One strange thing to me was the other couple that were there, the lady, had to have been in her 70s and the man with her about 20s, and he was all over her, like a honeymoon couple. I know I know, age is just a number beauty I behold her and all that but just weird. Regardless we enjoyed our night and made the plans to come back the next night as the music was good and drinks were cheap. So on comes the next day and we got ourselves so excited to return to this bar, ate our tea and set off to the bar, got to the point where it was, couldn't hear music. Started to walk up the stairs and the bar wasn't there, the building was there but instead of it being open plan with plastic wind curtain things outside it was all bricked up. We had walked up these stairs towards someone's house front. Needless to say the people who were around didn't half give us some funny looks, we walked up and down this street as we just couldn't believe this place didn't exist. If it wasn't for us both remembering it, and me taking a video of the inside, I'd have thought it was a dream. So yeah, not creepy but just baffling. So I was doing an outside sales job a few years back in the town of Klamath Falls, Oregon, population 21k, was in my territory. There was a customer there who also had an office in the nearby rural town of Chiliquin, Oregon, population 730, and I seemed to always be visiting when he was at the Chiliquin location. One day I decided to drive out there even though it wasn't technically in my territory, another rep handled that area, though I was sure he never went out there, not much reason to. On my way into town I noticed a small thrift store with vinyl records in the window. I made a mental note to stop on my way out of town. I visited with the customer, which was great, and as I was driving back I remembered to stop into that shop. It was a very odd looking building with a really crappy rock facade on one side and a few small windows on the other. As I attempted to go into what I thought was the front door, a little old man popped out of a side door and beckoned me to come down to that entrance. I walked into a room that contained his kitchen area and a dog bed with a dog on it. To the left behind a curtain, I assumed was his bedroom area and to the right was the thrift slash antique store. The place was very poorly lit and cluttered with a lot of antiques, junk. I told him that I came looking for some vinyl and he directed me to a corner with some milk crates full of old records. I sifted through for 5 or 10 minutes looking for a treasure. Up to this point I had not had a single red flag or anything go off in my brain. He then approached me and told me that he had some more vinyl in the back. I followed him down a different hallway than the one I came in and it was pitch black. It was at this moment that my spidey senses began to tingle. He turned a corner and flipped on a light and sure enough there were more milk crates with a lot more vinyl. I was cautious but at this point I thanked him and began to hunt. A minute or two in, every hair on my body stood on end and my stomach sank. He had put on a record. The song was No More I Love Used by Annie Lennox. The sound system was extremely lo-fi and muffled sounding. This is perhaps the creepiest song this man could have chosen to play at this particular moment. Up to this point we had talked briefly about classic rock, Beatles, Zep, The Who, Queen, so putting this song on made no sense and legitimately made me fear for my life. It was then that I realized that no one knew where I was. My company knew I was in Klamath Falls and so did my wife but I hadn't told anyone that I was going any further. I was convinced that the owner was going to come around the corner with a gun or knife in his hand. In fact I could almost see it happening in front of me. It took me a few moments to muster up the courage to very cautiously make my way to the hall, back to the main part of the store and to my vehicle. I've never been so convinced in my life that I was going to be murdered. I don't honestly know how well this is going to fit in here but, I during the summer I like to go fishing. I love to see the waves feel the breeze, and take it all in. I always go fishing in the ocean, and I live in Maine on the east coast. Anyways, this must have been last summer I went to go fishing with my cousin let's say Andrew, and we would set up our rods on the surf and go fishing from there. We typically set everything up before the sun is down. I can't remember exactly why but Andrew had to go home early one day and he was the one with the car, 
but I decided to stay behind to continue fishing it was a pretty good night so far already landed one fish. And I couldn't stop it there right? It must have been 40 minutes after sunset he left and all of the last streams of light were disappearing from the sky as the moon lit up the beachhead around me so I went back to my seat I set up and with my lamp started to read my book. The moon was full and the sky full of stars around me the ocean shimmering and still it was beautiful not another soul on the beach at this time of night. During the day Teresa a few people that will walk by and it's not uncommon to see another fisherman while you're on the beach. An hour or so passes by and I haven't had a hit on my rod in the longest time so I decide to switch the type of bait I'm using to something different, so I bring my tackle down to the surf and begin to reel in one of my rods and while I'm standing ankle deep in the cold Atlantic, I see someone standing hunched down in the surf maybe 60 or so odd meters away from me. Being me I was a little shocked I didn't notice this person before there is one typical entrance to the beach where everyone who wants to see the ocean goes through which is right near where I have my seat and lamp set up. So I anchor my rod and decide start to wave and try to see who it is. I start to walk over and as I got closer and closer it looked almost like a child slash young kid from their height just looking face down into the shallow water. I continued to walk and call to him slash her concerned admittedly at this point for this kid. But as I got closer and in the moonlight instead of seeing a shirt and whatnot they were covered in these grey scales, grey shiny scales. I saw on its back a spine like a fish with long quills coming out and webbing connecting them. I was maybe 15 feet away from it at this point. And by the time I realized this it was too late, I stood there as it began to get up where a human's face I thought would be there was a snout like a dog and big black eyes like a shark. With those eyes it looked over and me and I at it. I stood there perfectly still as it began to look up at sky open its mouth and let out horrifying sound. I'm not sure best how to describe that sound, I have never heard nor hopefully will ever again hear anything even like it. It sounded hurt in some strange way. And just like that it waded its way back out into the waves and into the ocean. So one day when I was around 12 or 13, my brother and I were hiking around the woods behind our house and we got lost. Now, we've been all around these woods hundreds of times. We have never gotten lost and we always knew how to get home. My brother was scared about being lost and starting running, trying to get back to familiar territory. I followed him and we came into this clearing that had an old wooden house. It had a red tin roof, and car hub cabs on the sides. There was barbed wire around in the yard. Keep in mind we have never seen this house before, in the hundreds of times we explored these woods. My brother was like we should go ask them if they have a phone. I had seen enough horror movies, specifically Wrong Turn, with creepy cabins in the woods and I was not having it. I refused and about that time we heard some dogs bark and we ran. Not even 5 minutes later we were back to the house. We have since tried to find the cabin and even a few years later a logging company came and cut down the whole forest. Theirs was nothing that even remotely could have looked like the cabin. We still get chills talking about almost 15 years later. I can't help, but wonder what would have happened if we had knocked. Last summer I was on a family trip in Colorado and we were driving to a cabin we were renting out in the Rockies. I was in the car with my parents and my girlfriend and my two brothers and sister-in-law were in another car. I see a sign for Ohio City and look it up on my phone and see that it's a ghost town. I ask my parents and girlfriend if they want to take a detour and go look at this place and they want to mainly because we are all from Ohio and thought it would be funny. We tell the other car about it but they decide not to take the detour cause they have a dog in the car and he was getting anxious. So we take the turn for Ohio City and drive for a while until we hit it. When we get there we expect to see nothing but falling apart buildings but instead there's a bunch of mobile homes, a general store, and a town hall. Nothing looks like it had left behind or forgotten. The weirdest part was that there were newish cars parked at all of the mobile homes but no one was around, and all the blinds on the mobile homes were drawn. The town hall had a posting about it being refurbished and the general store looked like it was closed for the day even though it was the middle of the afternoon. We were all creeped out by this place and lack of people even though people obviously lived there. We found an outhouse behind the town hall and took turns using it cause there was nowhere else to go. We all start heading back to the car when some guy on one of those beach cruiser bicycles casually strolls past us and waves at us but says nothing. We wave back and get into the car and hightail it out of there. Story 1, I was on a choir trip during my sophomore year of high school. We had to drive a long way and then stay the night so we were stopping for meals on the way. At lunchtime we're coming into a town no one on the bus has ever been to before and immediately we see what appears to be a Brahms, a chain of combination dinner slash grocery stores for those outside of my region of the US. It looks okay from a distance, but when we actually drive up to it we see the sign is gone and one of the windows is boarded up. We all look at each other and try to figure out whether we want a chance at still being operational. We decided we were really hungry. It was 1 or 2 in the afternoon and some of us, myself included hadn't had breakfast. So we go in 
and it turns out it was in fact being operated. I say being operated instead of operational, because operational isn't exactly the word I would use. The layout of a normal Browns is a front counter where you can order, which extends into a display of ice cream in the front. To one side of the store is a seating area, and to the other is the grocery store section, and set into the back, normally a second register where you can pay for your groceries. In this Browns, however, there was not a complete counter, and it appeared as though what would have normally been a closed off employees area behind the register created by the counter, instead consisted of the various soft serve machines and grills which would have normally been in the kitchen. By this I mean that the entire kitchen had been moved onto the main floor of the store, the dinner slash seating side of the store looked pretty normal. However, on what had obviously previously been the grocery side of the store there had been set up obviously different tables, and decorations. You could see the rust marks on the tile floors where the shelving had previously sat, and the wall freezers were still there, but dark, and empty. Still, for some stupendous reason we decided to order. The cashier on duty acted like she would rather be dead than have us in the store, and as we sat and ate the food, there was the most eerie feeling. I think it was due to the fact that there was no music playing over the speakers. The food also tasted very odd, and there was a weird smell that you noticed more the more you were there. Not bad or good, just strange. About 5 minutes into us eating weird people that definitely didn't look like they worked there started coming out of the back where presumably the empty kitchen was. They were dressed very weird. The strangest one was wearing nothing but pajama bottoms and rubber rain boots. Keep in mind this was around Christmas break so it was very cold outside. No one was going into the kitchen, but every few minutes, a new bizarre character would come out, and leave the store without talking to, or looking at anyone. I also have no idea where they were going or how because there had been no vehicles out front except for our bus when we pulled up. After a while of this, a few of us got up without finishing our food or saying anything, and the rest of us followed suit. We were all quite shaken. I swear all of this is true, but if you still believe me you may not anymore, because not one mile later, and over a hill we passed what looked to be a brand new, well-kept Brahms. Less than a mile away from the other, bizarre and scary Brahms. That memory will stick with me forever. Story number two, this was about three years ago. Me and the family were traveling back from our vacation in Yellowstone National Park, easily a four-day drive. On the last leg of our journey we were traveling through what I think was Kansas, and we were in the very rural empty part. One of us had to go to the bathroom so we were all desperately looking for any town. We finally found one and that's where it gets surreal. One of my biggest regrets in life is that I don't remember the name of this town, but it was something having to do with Rose. Rosemary or Rosenberg, or Rosington or something. The first thing we noticed when we took the exit is that the town wasn't on our map. However, my family is old-fashioned and still uses paper maps, or at least did at the time, and so that didn't bother us much. We pulled into town and started driving up and down the streets to try and find a gas station or a chain store or something that had a restroom. We also needed gas, so the priority was a gas station. From the very beginning this place was eerie. Downright eerie. There were no cars on the road, and no people outside of the buildings no noise whatsoever. We found a gas station, but it was closed. Now this was 2 or 3 p.m. on a Tuesday, so there is no good reason that it should have been closed. It didn't appear to be out of business. The windows were clean, and there was an open slash closed sign flipped to closed. Nothing was dusty or dirty. If you looked inside the shelves were well stoked. We did start to notice strange things though. Well mostly my grandfather noticed them. He's very detail-oriented. He noticed that the convenience store still sold blank VHS for recording and music on cassette. Both were visible on the shelves through the windows. He also noticed that most of the tags on the vehicles parked beside the road still had 2008 stickers on them FYI for people outside of the US, every year you have to renew your car license plate with a very expensive sticker that goes in the upper right hand corner. When he brought this to our attention we started looking closer at our surroundings. Despite there being vehicles in the driveway of all the houses, you couldn't see anyone through the front windows of the homes. In the case of one particular home you could see meal laid out on the table. Again, just like the store everything looked well kept. No dust or dirt. Just empty. We finally came to the conclusion that this town must have very recently become a ghost town for some bizarre, unexplainable reason. We decided to drive around and see some more of it. There was a school that didn't appear to be occupied but was otherwise in perfect order. This was the summer, so that wasn't weird, several more businesses with closed signs in the doors at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday. And more eerie houses. Another detail I've just remembered is that all the lawns were freshly mowed. The ones that had grass, anyway. And some of them had very well manicured lawns, before we left we decided to stop in front of the store again, it was on the way out, 
to get some sodas and snacks out of the trunk of the car. As we were sitting there we heard a slight noise in the deafening silence which was this town we all followed it with our gaze to what was probably the nicest house in that part of the town. There was a man in a button-up shirt and overall standing on the middle of the lawn, arms flat to his sides, staring at us, not saying anything or moving muscle. We all very quickly got back in the car and drove away. Wow that turned out longer than I expected. Anyway hope you guys enjoy. I don't remember the town name anymore, but when I did I scoured the internet for any information on it and found nothing. Any info from people who live in Kansas or bordering states that knows anything please tell me. Grew up in Southern Ohio. When I was 17 a buddy and I decided to go to all these creepy places that we'd heard about, just to deal ourselves out. The night ran the gambit of haunted Ohio spots. Crybaby Bridge, a country road where the woman in white supposedly hangs out, and this creepy farmhouse. The house is about a one quarter mile off a country road and totally abandoned. We drove up to it and didn't notice anything too weird. The windows and front door were boarded up, but a window on the side was slightly open. I was the only one who could fit through the window so I agreed to climb through and check the place out. I took his cell phone as a flashlight because it was pitch black outside. The window led into the kitchen which was empty besides this old refrigerator that looked like it was from the 60s. The living room was the only other room on the main floor and the only things in there were a fireplace and two wooden chairs in the corner stacked on top of each other. I headed up the stairs to and counted 13 on the way up, taking my time because each step let out a loud creak and felt like I was gonna fall through. At the top of the stairs was just a hallway with a few closed doors, but I couldn't see the end of the hall. Then I saw something move in the shadows. At first I was too scared to move, but as I stood there frozen I saw something moving towards me, but it didn't seem to be walking, just sort of moving closer. By the time it was about halfway to me I still couldn't make out what it was. It looked like a blackness, just absent of light, but not physically there. I finally realized what was happening and turned around and must have cleared those stairs in one jump. I slammed into the wall at the bottom and looked back in time to see that thing was halfway down the stairs. I ran for that open window in the kitchen and dove through it and bolted to my buddy's car. When I got in he was just chilling listening to A7X or some shit. Told him to fucking drive and we took off. To this day that shit scares me thinking about it. 2012, early September, Seligman, Arizona. I was traveling with my brother for medical school interviews from my home in SD, to Arizona. We had interviews on the same day, at the same school, so we turned this into our first trip together, flying into Vegas to see a friend, and then renting a car to go sightseeing before our interview in Phoenix. On our way through Arizona, we headed east towards Flagstaff, as we were hoping to get there, and then down to Sedona before dark, spoiler, we did not. The North American monsoon was underway, and a torrential rain greeted us on a highway through the highlands of Arizona. I had never driven in mountainous terrain before, and I quickly became aware of the risk of hydroplaning into the median, as the water has no fertile farmland to sink into, and a lack of sufficient vegetation to stop runoff. I opted to pull off at the next town, fill up with gas, and wait for the storm to pass. Next exit, Seligman. Pulling into the town, it seemed to be set up as some sort of tourist trap. It seemed to make a claim to fame for Route 66. The town itself was streamed with old, and quite dirty party banners, the kind with triangles, that looked like they had a party 8 months ago, but forgot to take down the decorations until next year's birthday. I pulled into the local gas station and began filling up with gas. As I was filling with gas about 5 people, 70 years or older, came out of the gas station, sat underneath the canopy of the station, and just stared in my direction. Shortly afterwards, an old pickup pulled up. The man in the vehicle was skinny, with those telltale skull outlines of countless years of methamphetamine. He stopped, rolled down to the crank window, and despite me being underneath the safety of the pump canopy he started cackling at me, you're going to melt. You're going to melt. You're going to melt. I can't remember how many times this happened, but I felt like I was about to be featured in a 30 seconds new spot of hopeful medical student murdered in Seligman mystery case, body never found he took off. He never filled up with gas. The observers on the porch remained silent. We decided the rain had died down enough that we could pass safely. After heading further east on I-40 car that passed us earlier had crashed into the stone median. This isn't exactly creepy, but definitely weird. My dad, sister, brother and my brother's girlfriend all went to a restaurant somewhere in California. It was a strangely lighted restaurant that was so dim it was almost too dark. Everyone seemed to be dressed the same. Not luxurious clothing however. Our waiter was a strange guy that showed no emotion and I don't think I ever saw a smile. When we looked at the menu we were all extremely confused. The entire menu was in English. 
but I literally could not understand what a single thing said. I am pretty sure the only word I recognized was duck. I am almost positive this wasn't some sort of restaurant with a different culture and that's why we couldn't understand the menu. It just literally made no sense to read. I think I recall my dad asking the waiter for assistance but he didn't really give much help with his charming personality as explained earlier. Finally we decided to just leave. I distinctly remember that waiter coming and was like alright what do you want to eat and my dad just said actually we don't want to eat we are leaving and the waiter looked surprised, which was the first time he ever showed emotion. When we left I grabbed some matches at the host stand. I have no idea where those matches went though, so I doubt I'll ever remember the name of the restaurant. While outside my bother joked that the entire restaurant had an eerie vibe that made it seem like it was some sort of vampire meeting place or something like that. I know he was joking but it makes sense looking back on it. Summer of 2014, I was lucky enough to study in Paris, France. One of the classes I took was the history of science in Paris. Our class was comprised of three other students and the professor. Our very first excursion was to La Cite des Sciences at De l'Industrie, Museum of Science and Industry. It was a very busy time on the metro, so we weren't together on the train, but the professor had told us at which stop we would need to transfer to another line. All was well and good, until we got to the stop. Me and the two other students my age got off the train, and turned around to see the professor and the older students still sitting on the car, just in time for the doors to close in our face and the train to leave the station. Turns out the professor had told us the wrong stop, realized it en route, and assumed that we wouldn't get off the train until he did. So we had no idea where we were or where we were going, no operational phones, and no way to ask someone to help us, yes, I know that a large amount of French people know enough English that we could have asked, but Parisian people can be really intimidating to newly arrived students. The metro map is not at all hard to interpret once you've been using it for a week or two, but on that first weekend, it was basically like trying to read a handful of rainbow spaghetti someone threw on a map. In any case, we figured out where to go and feeling quite proud of ourselves for doing so, set off. The first transfer we made was onto a far less busy train that serviced mostly small, less used stations. The next stop we got off at was. Different. There is a lot of old shit in Paris. But everything ages beautifully crumbling stone and dilapidated brickwork, rather than rotting derelict houses and busted out storefronts. To be fair, I was probably caught up enough in the magic of the historic city that my brain created blind spots over the unsightly construction and regular metropolitan filth. So when we stepped into the corridor, the state of it was jarring, to say the least. Firstly, we were the only ones that got off the train and everyone on the platform got on the train, leaving us alone. Much like in any big city, there aren't a lot of opportunities to be alone in public in Paris, especially in the middle of the day. And the silence was bizarre. Because there were no other people and no homeless people crouched on the floor, likely because it wasn't a busy enough station to successfully get money from passers-by, and the trains were spaced out, it was nearly silent also a rare find in a big city. The tiles of the wall were cracked and covered in nasty graffiti applied by unskilled artists. There was water dripping from somewhere in the ceiling that created puddles on the floor. Rather than being lit by the fluorescent lighting of other stations, the corridor was illuminated by exposed hanging bulbs the kind that were dim, yellow, and let off a hum too quiet to hear but loud enough to make your ears twitch. They were spaced out just far enough to leave fairly dark patches in between. And thanks to the breeze, the bulbs swung back and forth slowly. The tunnel was curved, so we couldn't see how long it was. We were all three quite creeped out, but we were talking loudly to compensate for the silence and joking around as we speed walked to the end of the tunnel, where we expected to either get to the lobby area that would lead to other platforms, or to the stairs that would lead to the street level and we could find the entrance that would take us to the other platforms. But no. We turned the corner and found another corridor. This one was barely a corridor and more like a tunnel, to be honest. The walls weren't walls, but instead big tarps, like the kind that would contain the dust of a construction area, translucent enough to reveal that they didn't cover walls, but instead yawning darkness. And still, not a soul not another passenger, employee, or beggar. Just the three of us, suddenly silenced of our jest, and scooting closer together as our hackles raised. Our steps and more mysterious dripping echoed in the seemingly cavernous space. The lights were even more sparse here, and several of them were completely burnt out. Again, this tunnel was curved, and even longer than the first. We saw the end of the tunnel and at this point we were nearly jogging, since beyond the tunnel was better lit and appeared to be the lobby. But no. Another desolate tunnel. This one, lit with flickering fluorescent fixtures that audibly buzzed, stark concrete walls, and still not a soul in sight. At this point, we were far from the platform and no longer walled in by flimsy tarp. The silence felt almost claustrophobic. 
Every step and breath seemed amplified, and our voice bounced aggressively back at us, so we stopped talking for the most part. We had already been walking for a weirdly long time and this tunnel was the longest of all. At this point, we were starting to worry that we had stumbled into an area that we weren't supposed to be in and wondered if it would be best to go back, catch the next train, and figure out an alternate route to the museum, or maybe just go back to our housing and hope our professor would forgive us. But we had all been quite excited for the excursion and didn't want our professors to worry about us, so we pressed on. It felt like we walked for an hour, though it was closer to 20 minutes, before we finally got to the stairs up to the street. None of us could figure out the layout of the train station, as in how so much tunnel managed to fit under the street, but nonetheless we were all three unwilling to go back down there to catch the next train we were supposed to transfer to. We ended up walking to the next stop for the line we wanted to get on. Thankfully, it was regular loud, packed, busy metro station. We did manage to get to our professor, who made fun of us for getting off at the wrong stop in the first place. From when I was 12 to 18 I was in a regional youth orchestra. In 2007 we had won a competition. The prize was to perform in a concert by young musicians at the Royal Albert Hall. Our convoy there and back consisted of several coaches, a coach for our orchestra, a coach for an orchestra in the next county over who had also won a place to perform at the concert, and a supporters coach for family members of the kids performing in the concert. Supporters who wanted to attend the concert but were not lucky enough to get seats on the supporters coach had to make their own way to the Royal Albert Hall. It took at least three hours to get to the Albert Hall from our departure point. By the time the concert had finished it was quite late, and by the time we got back to our part of the country, it was the early hours of the morning. As we were traveling down this pitch black country road running between the hills, we took an unexpected turn left. This confused us and we all started pressing our faces up against the windows to get a better view outside, as the lights were on inside the coach. From the lights of the coach, we could see that we had pulled into a very old, abandoned looking petrol station. A girl from the other orchestra coach got off with her instrument and an adult male that I assumed was her conductor. One of our conductors sat at the front of our coach stood up and explained that we were dropping this girl off here as her parents were going to meet her here, but they hadn't turned up yet. We waited several minutes, then the man that had got off the coach with the girl turned, walked back to his coach, and got back on. Our coach then revved, and started to pull away from the petrol station with the other coaches in pursuit. The girl's parents still hadn't arrived and we were leaving her all alone at a pitch black, old, abandoned looking petrol station, on a quiet, pitch black country road. We started going nuts and yelling at the driver that we couldn't leave her there alone and demanding that we go back and wait with her. We didn't feel that it was a safe situation for her to be in. We were horrified. We were told by one of the adults down the front of the coach that we couldn't wait any longer due to the time and had to keep going. We were not at all impressed. I checked the news frequently for a while hoping that nothing bad had become of this girl. Nothing came up so I assumed that she was okay, hopefully. I have been along that same country road several times since that night in the daylight, and have never been able to see or find that petrol station again. My mate and I used to carpool to go to uni as we lived near each other and took the same classes at a campus that was about 45 minutes away. Although the trip went through some semi-rural areas, there were a lot of roads between our hometown and the campus so to make the trip less boring we tried to go a different route home each time. It was pretty easy, as long as the car was pointing in the right direction eventually you would emerge on a familiar road and make your way home. Some of the roads were better than others, but my car was a 1962 Valiant so we didn't have any ground clearance problems on rough dirt tracks and almost all of the roads were sealed anyway. One day we found ourselves on a dirt road, set between two paddocks. It was a nice smooth road and the car was kicking up a very satisfying plume of dust behind it. We had no idea where we were but we were going in the right direction and were about halfway home. Suddenly, the road just ended. We had not seen a house in a while so it was strange that the road should even exist since it didn't seem to go anywhere. The end of the road was a small round area where you could turn around. Or at least, you could turn around if the area wasn't full of cars, about 6 to 8 cars and about 6 to 8 men standing around, looking at the dusty black monstrosity that had just lumbered up to them. At this point we weren't sure what to do. We couldn't turn around as the cars filled the turning area. We had no idea why this group of random men were in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the day but they hadn't moved much since we had arrived. A brief Mexican standoff ensued. One of the men started walking towards us, stooping to pick up a big stick. It was time to go. I put the car into reverse and stomped it. The man kept coming but luckily did not break into a run, not that he would have caught us. When we had traveled a short distance I turned the car around and GTFO of there in a hail of stones and dust, some of which hit the men, hopefully. We didn't go that way anymore. 
Mine happened just this past May, actually. The pre-story is kind of long, so I apologize for that. My girlfriend and I were vacationing in Cuba and we were in this city called Matanzas. We had gotten a room at this little place and already had a really weird experience there that I can get into another time. Anyway, we go out looking for a good place to eat and we came across this little Italian restaurant that was run by a family. There were tables out front and a few other diners hanging out. So we sat down and the young waiter brought us menus and my girlfriend and I were talking between the two of us about what to order and we were speaking English to each other. When it came time to order, we ordered in Spanish, because almost nobody speaks English out there. We ordered a spaghetti and a pizza, and our waiter asked us in English which spaghetti we wanted because there were a few different options. We were surprised by the English and so we started asking him questions. He only spoke a bit of English, but his friend, the owner knows really good English he said. So he put our order in and went to get the owner. The owner came out and was really happy to see Americans in his restaurant and was excited to use his English, so he spent some time talking with us. Our food came out and he told us to enjoy our dinner, but before we leave he wanted us to meet his dad. We told him we would be happy to meet and talk with him. So the owner disappeared for a bit. About halfway through the best meal we had eaten outside of my girlfriend's family's home, the owner returned with his dad who sat down with us and started talking with us. He also spoke very good English and we spent some time talking about his work as a translator for English-speaking missionaries. At this point, both the father and son were talking to us and we had finished with our meal. The son had asked at some point if we were going to be in the area for long and if we would like to come back for dinner the following day. Of course, we said we would love to come back and have dinner. He said they would be open all day the following day and would look forward to speaking with us again. He left satisfied, probably to close up the restaurant. All the other diners had left by that point and it was just the three of us now. Since this isn't the actual weird slash creepy part of the story, I'll just summarize and say that we ended up stuck talking with this old man for a couple extra hours, where he got really dark and odd. He started on politics and other inappropriate first time meeting things before we could get away and go back to our rented room. The major point of this part of the story is to say we spent a lot of time here at this place and got to really know a few of these people. Now the actual strange part was the next day. We returned to that part of town after spending a few hours exploring and wanted to have an early dinner. We arrived at the building and there were no tables out front, no sign of any employees, or other diners. We went to the front door and it had blue plastic ribbon wrapped around it and the front porch was all dusty. The windows were covered and you couldn't see in. It looked like nobody had been there in months. We knocked loudly on the door, called out to the windows, and waited for about three minutes with no response. We both were a bit spooked by the appearance of the place, so we left. We got about a block down the road, and I didn't tell my girlfriend about it, but I looked back and there was a figure of a man standing in the lot watching us walk away. We refer to those first two days in Matanzas as our Twilight Zone experience. Okay so this last winter my family went to New Mexico for our trip. Our plane landed in Albuquerque airport around 5.30. We drove through the state and stopped in Santa Fe. We kept on driving and went to the city of Taos. We had booked an Airbnb in the small suburb of Arroyo Seco. We had the address for the place plugged in on the GPS. We think that we are close and the GPS tells us to make a turn on this side road. The side road leads to an old compound that had people living there. We knew because there were small houses, rusted RVs and old rusted cars. We were getting a vibe that we were not in the right place and that something bad would happen to us if we stayed a little longer. The old place was inhabited, but at night, with scrap metal as fences, we got scared. We turned back to the freeway and pulled over. We called the owner of the B&B and led us to our house. The whole experience scared us and made us think that something was not right. So now, it is August 6th and a news article about how a man who had kidnapped a child and malnourished his other children to death in a weird compound in New Mexico came out. The scariest thing about it? It was in Taos County, and that compound looked eerily familiar imagine if we had stayed there a little longer. My sister and her guy friend were on a hike far up a canyon in Southern California. There are a ton of canyons along the coast in Malibu which wind up to networks of trails, some more developed than others. This was a canyon her friend had hiked before but they decided to take a different direction than he had gone before. So they're going through more lightly traveled territory way come upon a clearing which opens across to a wall of trees marking the edge of a forest. She says that as soon as they stepped into the clearing they both stopped dead in their tracks and went cold. They stood there frozen in fear and then looked at each other and he said we have to get out of here right now. They turned and quickly walked away without looking back, feeling this dreadful energy still hanging with them as they moved faster and faster, not talking, just leaving the area. They got back to the car and agreed. What was that? Cut to four years later, my sister's boyfriend, not the guy from earlier, 
is talking to their landlord Tom by a fire pit exchanging stories. Tom says that one time he was on a date, up that canyon and they hiked out to this certain place where there's a clearing before a bunch of trees and it has a bad energy like something horrible must have happened there. My sister's boyfriend's jaw drops and he tells the landlord her matching story and Tom just nods yep, he said he believes it is a place where the indigenous people, most likely Chumash, were killed and are buried en masse. My husband, he was asleep at this point, and I were in our way to my sister's house in a different town about 7 hours away, when I thought I would take a shortcut and drive down a road I remember my dad taking as a shortcut. Now a little backstory, I grew up 90 miles from this town and knew it pretty well and I had seen my dad take this road the year before. Now one thing to note is there was this huge entryway when you got onto this road from the highway and it was the second road after entering the town limits and that was how I was able to remember this shortcut. This road was at the base of a hill that my sister's university was at and the whole university is on one side of the highway I just exited. From what I remembered as my dad taking this shortcut it took us 30 minutes from the end of the university to the highway taking this shortcut and it sort of wound down the hill. While driving through this road I had not seen any cars drive past and there were no street lights at all along this road. After about 30 minutes I was still driving straight and had passed this random fence on both sides of the road, freaked out thinking it was either private land or a part of the government lands I thought to turn around but did not. I told myself I would drive a few more miles to see if there was anyone or anything but after 30 minutes I wound up on the other side of the highway facing the entryway. My husband woke up at this point sort of out of it still and asked what was going on, I told him nothing and just turned on the highway and went through a main road to my sister place. To add to the confusion I have never seen the entryway since and there are no roads before the main road I wound up taking after my husband woke up into the town. For the past few days my girlfriend and I have been driving up US West Coast. Due to an error in research, we didn't research at all, we ended turning what was supposed to be an 8-hour drive into a 16-hour drive. We hit a couple creepy towns along the way, but three stand out in particular. The first seemed alright at first, well populated with lots of places to eat. But it felt off. There were no pedestrians, either at the gas stations or the fast food places. It gave me a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach, a lot like a Stephen King novel. We left without stopping for lunch. We arrived at the second place at roughly midnight needing gas. It was a bit more direct with its creep factor. There was a bug the size of a damned bird that slammed into the pump we were parked at hard enough to stun itself and took two stomps to kill. A lone white car circled us in the gas station before leaving without a word. The pump wouldn't accept our card and the station indoors was closed, so when we started to go further into town there were no street lamps and the street lights seemed to be broke and were just flashing red. We noped on out of there and continued without the gas. As a last creep of that place there was a lone hitchhiker in the darkness. The third place was immediate with its creep and immediate with our departure. It was lit up with a variety of floodlights and street lamps. Flashing signs and orange construction alerts all pointed to an event being held at the center of town. In said center were what seemed like tents or maybe cabins. I can't honestly say because we didn't even slow down when we went by. After all these places we were desperate for gas, refreshments, and a bathroom break. We drove through a town and found a shell station. It will sound silly and like I'm hyperbolizing, but that shell station was one of the most hopeful sights I've seen. It was manned by a kindly older lady and the only other customers were obviously just people finishing with their late shifts coming in for a slushy. It was like a bit of light and rest in a long night of anxiety. About 15 years ago I was on a trip halfway across the country, heading from the coast of California to eastern Kansas. The stretch of drive through eastern Colorado is long and there aren't a ton of stops, so if you miss a stop for gas and your tank is low, you can really screw yourself over. Well, we missed our stop for gas and were really getting down to the wire when we saw a sign for Canarado, just after the Colorado slash Kansas border, indicating stops for gas and food. Awesome. We took the exit, which went through an underpass and led out at a frontage road that could be taken into town. As we pulled closer to town, things started to feel off. There was a gas station at the entrance to town, but the sign was faded. Windows were all busted out and it was totally empty. The other buildings alongside it looked old and long out of commission. Okay, maybe we hadn't quite made it into town? We crept forward in the car, still along this frontage road with a giant granary next to us blocking the view of what was slightly ahead to the right. So far, there were no people or cars anywhere. To be fair, it was a cold cloudy day but it was around 6 p.m. We were getting creeped out, wondering aloud if maybe the town had been abandoned. That's when we saw it. To the right, the road led into the granary access and then continued into a residential area. No cars or people around the houses, but the entire end half of the fence bordering the granary had dozens upon dozens of tents built alongside it. 
They looked like they'd been there a while, but had a few indications that they were still in use. This was pretty much when we noped out of there. The misleading signs for gas and the current state of the town made it feel all too possible that it was some kind of trap. Our tank was on empty at this point and I'd much rather have been stranded along the freeway than in this creepy little town. We made it into the next town about 15 miles later so it turned out okay. I went back to Canarado a few years later while driving the same route with some friends I'd told the story to. The gas station was boarded up now, and the tents were gone. It was midday so we were feeling brave and drove a little further into town. It seemed to be a little more alive than last time, though we still didn't see any people around. I did see a front yard with a dog that had grapefruit-sized balls though, which was pretty weird. 